Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, I'm going to get started. This is Liz uh, and my colleague Megan is here and she'll be jumping uh, in as uh, it makes sense uh, with the presentation today. First of all, thank you for attending. Uh, this presentation um, is happening in part to the Mass Department of uh, Agriculture, the Massachusetts Farm Energy Program, and the Rural Business Development uh, Office of the USDA. Um, so just a couple notes before I totally get into the presentation. The first, and I've said this for uh, several of you, but there's a couple new people who have signed on, is that there are two handouts uh, in the handout section of the webinar platform. Uh, one is a, a PDF of this presentation, so that you can download that for reference. And, and another is the Small Business Administration table, which uh, will make sense when we get into the presentation in a little bit. Um, everybody is currently muted, um, but if you do have questions that arise while I'm giving the presentation, please feel free to use the questions section of uh, the webinar platform, and we'll try to answer them as they come in um, so that we can kind of stay on the, on the topic when the questions arise. But uh, I will unmute people at the end of the presentation uh, to answer any questions uh, that might be lingering. Um, and so, yeah, uh, this, uh, we're also recording this webinar, so it will be available after um, in case people want to reference it, and we'll uh, send out an email later on to everyone who attended. Um, so again, thank you for attending. Uh, we're going to be going over the Rural Energy for America program application. Um, as many of you might know, there's a deadline coming up. It's, it's still October 31st. Yes, October 31st. I always have to get confirmation on that. It um, uh, happens twice a year, the fall deadline being October 31st, and the spring deadline being typically uh, March 31st. But Occasionally, if the date lands on a weekend, it'll be moved um, to either the following Monday. Um, so, all right, without further ado, let's just talk a little bit about um, the repo. Okay. Um, so, before I get too deeply into it, we do like to talk a little bit about the different grant agencies that are available um, uh, to help um, agricultural businesses implement um, energy efficiency and renewable energy projects. Um, the USDA Rural Development has their REAP program. And the Massachusetts Department of Agriculture has the MDAR grant, um, which comes out in the end of spring, beginning of summer. Oh, it's sometime, sometime in April, typically, yes. when it comes out. It yes. varies a little bit every year. Um, and they, uh, the Massachusetts Department of Agriculture also offers audit assistance. So if anybody's uh, interested in helping, uh, get, needing help getting an audit, um, the Mass Farm Energy Program can help with that. And uh, Megan and I are both contacts. So understanding a little bit about the REAP grant assistance program, so it offers up to 25% of eligible project costs. Um, and so the minimum grant request for, um, there's two, two, you can apply for renewable energy and energy efficiency. The minim, minimum for renewable energy systems is 2,500, which means your total project cost would have to be uh, 10,000. And the maximum grant request can be 500,000, which means the total eligible project costs need to be uh, greater than 2 million. Um, energy efficiency is a little bit lower uh, a maximum, uh, so you have 1,500 for the minimum and uh, 25, uh, 250,000 rather um, for maximum. And um, you can apply for one energy efficiency and one renewable energy uh, application in in any one year. So you could. Theoretically, um, if you see the little tagline on the bottom of the slide, it says the max you would be eligible to uh, uh, apply for assistance would be that 750k, which um, uh, just FYI, most of the time the state allocations for these programs are nowhere near those maximums, so you likely uh, wouldn't get that maximum. If you ask for it, you might get a portion of it. All right, so what are the eligible technologies that you can apply for um, to REAP? So for on the energy efficiency side, there's lighting, heating, cooling, ventilation, fans, automated controls, insulation. And on the renewable energy side, there's solar thermal uh, and photovoltaic. Um, there's wind, small hydroelectric, anaerobic digesters, biomass, geothermal, uh, wave, and ocean power. Um, the big thing here is that the technology needs to be commercially available um, and research and development projects don't qualify. Um, and technology that's commercially available, it's, it's basically the, the way we talk to farmers is, is, is it certified by some certifying agency and is easy to get. Those are kind of the general, like, very bare bones 
guidelines. There's some more specifics that we'll get into a little bit later. So um, there's a, a large variety of uh, eligible technologies, and um, what we see oftentimes being the most beneficial is when um, farms are able to combine energy efficiency and renewable energy um, projects, kind of one before the other, to get the maximum benefit to them. All right, so big question is always, what is the eligible project cost? Um, so eligible project costs, first of all, um, equipment, um, the purchase and installation, new or refurbished. Refurbished has to be certified, um, and I believe we have a slide a little bit later about that. Um, it is only post-application construction and facility improvement. So one of the neat um, things about the, the REAP program is, you can, let's say you are ready to start um, construction, but you um, but you're holding off because you want to apply for some grants. Read is neat. Once you've submitted and they and they've accepted and said your application is complete, you can actually begin construction. You simply have to sign a waiver saying that we understand we're beginning, beginning construction and we may not get a gr the grant, um, but you are able to start as long as the application has been submitted um, and accepted. So that's what post application means for construction and facility improvement. And you don't have to wait until the deadline to submit your application. You can submit it whenever you feel like it's complete. Good point. Yep. So um, retrofitting is um, an eligible project cost. Professional service fees um, are eligible. Uh, permits and license fees, working capital, um, that's really only for uh, um, guaranteeing loan only. So uh, second, second meters, this is common when we're looking at uh, solar um, PV. Oftentimes a second meter has to be installed because uh, a farm or even a small business likely has one meter combined and associated with both their residents and their business. So second meters are often, um, often something that has to get installed and uh, is, is an eligible cost. Other sorts of fees like permits uh, and licenses are also eligible. So ineligible um, uh, costs are residential energy projects, um, equipment uh, for farm tillage or uh, equipment used um, like on the farm for farm processes other than uh, what is a, an eligible product. So uh, a tractor trailer for a tractor would not be eligible. Um, used equipment, um, it, again, refurbished is fine, used is not. Um, and refurbish the difference there is there's certification uh, and it's usually uh, sold by a dealer. Uh, and then vehicles are not eligible. Um, any sort of costs incurred prior to the application submission and acceptance are not eligible. Um, application preparation or grant writer fees are not eligible. I will say that the Center for Ecotechnology um, offers um, free application assistance to, to rural small businesses and farms, so if, if people need help filling out these forms, we can do that. Um, lines of credit, not eligible. Um, lease payments um, or payment directly to the business owner or beneficiary relative, and then inevitable construction costs. So this is a really interesting one. Um, so we t oftentimes we talk about um, the, in, the, in the idea of PV, we talk about sometimes a, a new roof has to be put on, um, or a um, if it's some basically if it's something that would have to be done anyways, regardless of whether you were doing the project or not, it is not eligible. If you have to do something special because of the project, then it is eligible. So, and there's Whenever uh, we come up against that at CEP, we like to refer people directly to um, the, the REAP rep um, at, at um, USDA and CREA and, and Jonathan, who I believe is on this and might be able to better explain that if there are questions regarding it. Um, keep moving here. So who is eligible for REAP? This is uh, not as simple a, a <laughs> A question as I wish it was. So you can be an agricultural producer or a rural small, small business and be eligible. And so we're going to go over what agricultural producer means because this is oftentimes uh, an important question. So an agricultural producer doesn't have to be in a rural area. So that's one of the benefits. If you qualify 
Uh, if you don't qualify as a small business, but you happen to be an ag producer, you can still qualify for the REAP program. So an individual uh, or entity that receives 51% or more of their gross income from agricultural production um, is considered an agricultural producer. When we work with a lot of farms, we oftentimes discover that, um, so when the gross income is taken into account, it is all income. So you might have farm income, but somebody else in your family has a full-time job, and then maybe you have a part-time job. It is the gross income of everybody, and then what percent of the farm is, is of that income. So it has to be 51% of that. And I will actually, let's see, I want to get up an example. So when we work with farms, we oftentimes, um, they have a Schedule F. Not all farms uh, fill out a Schedule F. Sometimes if they're uh, um, a, more of a small business, they might not fill it out. But so on a Schedule F, it would say what your gross profit or loss is down at the bottom. And basically, you take that number and you figure out what percent of the total income on the tax form um, is is that farm income. So if it's less than 51%, you cannot qualify as an agricultural producer. However, you might qualify as um, a rural small business. So a rural small business uh, is determined by um, the Small Business Administration size standards. Um, you also have to be in a rural area or non-metro community of less than 50,000 uh, in population. And there is a tool on the website, and I will go over that in just a moment. So the small business size standards, that's one of the handouts that I mentioned earlier um, that is part of uh, the webinar platform. If you go to the handout section, you can download that. So here's where knowing, um, so there's the NAICS code. Um, on, on the tax forms, and I, I will actually pull the Schedule F back up. So again, lots of farmers use the Schedule F, and not all do. And a lot of farms don't know their NAICS code, but where it says in box B, enter the code from part four, that's it. That's your NAICS code. So for instance, let's use this one. This is Liz and Megan's farm. We are an apple orchard, and this is our NAICS code. So if we are to go to that PDF that's attached and search for that NAICS code, which I have Boom, it comes up. We're an apple orchard, and this is what it is. And here's the size standard in millions of dollars. So I believe that means $7,500,000. I think it's $750,000. Oh, yeah, because it's 0.75. Yeah. Times it by So if we have a gross income of less than $750,000 a year, we are considered a small business. Which, if you were to look back at the, <laughs> the other PDF that we, we just made, we, we definitely qualify. So that is um, that is the Small Business Administration size standards, and again, uh, that PDF is included um, as a handout, so you can download it if you would like. And one other thing, um, I matched that NAICS code really well, so it had all the numbers. Sometimes it'll only say like 1113 and then have a bunch of zeros at the end. Um, you just have to get sort of close, and you'll see in the second column it says what it is. So if you know what kind of farm you are, you can also um, figure it out sort of backwards. Yeah, by typing in like if you're if you farm wheat, you can type in the word wheat into the PDF and or it'll apple, or apples or, or anything like that. It'll yeah. highlight those words so that you'll hopefully be able to narrow down what your next code is. Again, it should be on all the tax forms. Um, occasionally, we've discovered it hard to decipher, um, and that's usually when a farm is filing not as a an agricultural producer, but yeah. as something else. These are all things we can help you with. If you have a question, if you're filling it out and you're like, I don't know. I don't know what this is. Send well, us an email. Yes, yeah, we can help. All right. All right, so we did mention uh, what is rural. So uh, rural development has a property eligibility tool, and I'm actually going to go ahead and go to that now and just walk you through it. Um, just so you can see what it is like. So you go, uh, you, can, you can literally just type in um, REAP eligibility, and it, it should pop up off of the website. Um, so you'll see here there's two different ones. You're looking for, for REAP. So here's REAP. You're going to click here, the following programs. You have to understand that there might be errors, and you have to accept um, the disclaimer. And then what it's going to do is it's going to bring up a, a, a geomap, kind of like Google, if you want to, 
and you're just going to type in um, an address. I'm going to type in an address. Just MA will probably yeah. be fine. And I can do, I actually know the zip code. I gave it a space. And you'll hit go. And if you are in an eligible area, it will be green. <laughs> um, if you are not in an eligible area, it will be um, orange. I need this address. Yeah, I can do that. And I'll do the address we're at now. I don't actually know our it's fine. zip code, but I don't but think it, you have to know the zip code. I might have to put the state, so. No, it's figured, figured it out. It'll well, be red and be like, no. And you can also tell from the background color of the map that it is not eligible. So you can look. So it can be very funky. Sometimes people are on the line <laughs> and part of their property might be eligible and part of it isn't. I think we typically referred those individuals to um, and USDA, or yeah. you at USDA just be like, uh, talk to them. We're not quite sure because if there's multiple addresses for a business. Um, so you can see that orange yellow kind of color. All of this is this orange yellow color is not eligible, but all the whiter kind of tan, I guess, mm -hmm. is. So that's that tool, and that's that's really important to if you don't qualify as an ag producer to make sure that you're actually a rural small business because if you aren't, you can't apply. All right. No questions on stuff yet. That's good. That's typically the first thing I check whenever someone comes to me for help is like, are you going to be eligible? Yeah. So the application, this is probably what most of you really want to know about how to how to complete it. Um, once you've determined that you are eligible, it's, it's on to the application. So like I said, um, we at CEP um, can help fill out those applications or help with any other sorts of questions regarding um, them. Uh, but let's get into a little bit of the components of the application. So there are multiple attachments um, for a full, uh, full complete um, application. There's the proposal for whatever the project is you're going to do. If it's a renewable uh, energy project, typically uh, the solar contractor or the, the contractor that's installing that renewable energy system will provide a proposal. Um, tax returns and payroll forms are really important for eligibility, uh, and you have to provide three years of them. If you don't have three years of business history, I believe you can work with an accountant to do a projection forward, and that can be used. Um, but often, oftentimes, again, we refer you to uh, USDA directly because they can answer those questions more concretely. Um, but we have had people in the past that have not had that history and have sim simply um, kind of created uh, the history of what or what they expect the business to be performing in the next few years by working with an accountant. Um, so for energy uh, efficiency um, projects, an, an audit, an energy audit is required. Um, for um, all of them, a commitment of funds documentation. So the more amount of funds you can demonstrate that you have cash on hand to pay for this project or that you have um, uh, other grants or loans lined up to help pay for the project, that will help increase the um, possibility of getting funding because oftentimes we, USDA doesn't want to fund a project that they're not sure is going to happen. If you, the more you have lined up in, in, in funding the project, the better. The big thing I also like to mention here, and I believe I'll mention it a little bit later, is all of these grants that people tend to go after are reimbursable, which means a, a Entity has to have all of the funds up front in order to pay for a project and then is reimbursed for the cost that they incur as part of the project. Um, this oftentimes can be difficult, but um, the FSA, the what is that, Farm Service Administration, I think is what the FSA stands for, they offer um, loans, USDA offers uh, or guaranteed back loans, um, and you can oftentimes work with a local bank. Um, or the Farm Service Administration to help uh, figure out just an interim bridge loan that will help you pay all the costs so that you can then be reimbursed uh, and pay off the loan. Uh, so getting a little bit more into the attachments, so feasibility sites for any renewable energy systems that are over a cost of 200000 you have to do a feasibility study. Uh, and if your project is over that, that threshold, you also have to do financial statements. Um, 
Feasibility studies are a little bit more intense than audits, so it's just good to keep in mind they take a little bit longer to complete. So um, just keep that in mind if that is something you're interested in, you do know that the total project costs are going to be that large. Um, the standard form, the SF424 forms are um, required, and those are uh, available on grants.gov and also as part of the application package, which I believe we still have this year and can email it out to anybody who is interested. And then the 1940-20 is the environmental uh, review info, and it's basically just like a little survey where you have to check some boxes saying, no, this shouldn't impact this, and you fill it out to the best of your ability and, and you sign it saying you basically live on. A lot of these federal forms are very standardized and can be found online, uh, and directions for them as well can be found online. Right, but um, <clears throat> the USDA for Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut, mm -hmm. that's what this REAP grant sort of covers, um, has put together all of the supplemental forms you need into a single PDF yeah. that we have. You don't have to go hunting for them. Yeah, it's called. We have the binder. Yeah, it's called the binder. And so we they're all bound together. And depending on the size of the project that you're doing, you will need a different series of forms. Sometimes, uh, like we were, like I was just mentioning, the higher the project cost, the more in depth the forms are going to be that you're going to have to fill out. So, in, in addition to all those attachments and the forms that you have to fill out, there are two federal ID numbers that that a business has to have. It's the Duns, which is the uh, Dun and Bradstreet, something or other. Um, and that is a unique identifying number that is free to get. I really stress the free to get um, because there are scams out there that charge people to get those numbers and you shouldn't ever have to pay for a Duns number. And the second is the SAM cage code, which is the system for award management, which is the federal kind of award management system, and you are also required to have that. You cannot get a SAM code unless you have a DUN. So DUNs, we've been seeing, um, we always like to say give yourself at least six weeks to get uh, any of these numbers, um, but DUNs have been, as long as there is no issue with your registration, the DUNs will take a couple weeks. It could take up to six if there are issues. I find that most farms and businesses already have a DUNS number, they just don't know what it is. Yep. So they just have to go onto the website and create an account and then it tells you what it is right there. There's been very few that don't have one at all. And then once you have a DUNS, you can apply for your SAM CAGE code. So um, I will also put a plug in on Thursday, we are doing a webinar that is solely about get, securing a DUNS and a SAM CAGE code. And again, it's the same time frame, but that presentation really should only take a half hour, and we can also provide direct assistance to businesses to secure those numbers. Again, you need a done before you can get a SAM cage code. And we have had the most issues uh, with people trying to get SAM cage codes because if stuff doesn't match exactly <laughs> what it says in the done, it, it won't go through. Um, so it's just important to note there that things need to match exactly if you are going to go uh, forward with that process. All right. Continuing on. So do I need an assessment or an audit? So for an energy efficiency application, yes. You, for projects under 200K, you need at least an assessment. And for projects over the 200K, you need an audit. Um, oftentimes, we recommend to farms, because there is currently a program, especially if they're located in Massachusetts, um, a program that helps them pay for the uh, up to 75% of the cost of audit, we say go for getting an audit, because an audit is going to qualify you for uh, more grant programs. For instance, if you wanted to go after REAP this fall, but then are interested in going after getting um, uh, funding for another project in the spring from MDAR, uh, you would need an audit in order to do that. And so might as well go ahead and get a full audit um, that will allow you to have a document that's good for, I believe, five years uh, for any of the projects that it uh, studies. And again, we um, help administer the program where it can cover up to 75% of the cost of that audit. So just important to know. So renewable energy applications, you typically don't need um, an audit or an assessment. Uh, it really depends on the size. Uh, oftentimes with the solar um, installer, and I'm saying solar because that's the most common thing we're seeing, but whatever the contractor uh, develops, that proposal should have enough information in it uh, to qualify. However, that, that changes once the project size is over 200K. You need a feasibility study, even if you're not asking for um, 
the maximum you're eligible to ask for for, uh, for 200K. So that's important to know too. If your project cost is over 200K, you absolutely have to get a feasibility study um, and leave some extra time to do so because it does take a little longer than you think. So who can do what is important to, to know here. This is a question we get oftentimes. We uh, work with a couple of partners to, to do the feasibility studies and the audits. Um, but so for over 200K, you absolutely need an auditor. That's someone who's certified, who has a certain number of years of experience um, and qualifies under um, the regulations. If you're interested in what those regulations are, I am happy to send them to you and explain them in a little bit more in depth, but it's probably more in depth than we need to get today. Uh, 80 to 200K, it could be an auditor, an assessor, or an individual supervised by either of the above. And then for less than 80K, it can be an audit auditor, an assessor, or an individual or entity with three, uh, uh, three years of uh, three years of and uh, three years of experience um, or more with those particular systems, um, up to five systems, I believe. Okay. So. How do you get not talk a little bit about this? MFVP has the assistance. We cover up to 75%. There is a 25% cost share that the farm has to um, pay. Um, but we, we will ensure that whatever the farm ends up with, the final document will meet both REAP and MDR grant requirements. Um, and that a full ag EMP, which is something that oftentimes uh, farms want to go after, will uh, be accepted by REAP under and NRCS. So NRCS is another USDA entity that can provide funding for projects. So it's just another option and another source of funding. Talked a little bit about this, um, the assessment versus the audit. So typically a targeted assessment is really focusing on one project or replacement of one piece of equipment. So it's very specified and narrow. Um, and the typical cost is around $600, but it varies depending on what the item is or the project specifically that's being examined. If a larger project, like a, a completely new boiler system for multiple greenhouses, that's gonna cost a little bit more. But if it's just one you know, heating system replacement for one greenhouse, that's gonna be a little bit less. Um, so again, MFPP can cover, MFPP can cover up to 75% of the cost. So in this case, it would be 450 would be covered by MFVP, and then the farm share would be $150. So for the audit, it's more comprehensive. It, it covers a lot more. It looks at more multiple opportunities um, uh, on site. And the typical cost is around $1,200. Again, that's a generalized. We see them as high as $2,500 and as low as $900. It really depends on what the size of the business and what um, uh, they're looking to do. So in this case, it would be 900 would be what MSUP covers and 300 would be the farm share. So the Dun & Bad Street Data Universal Numbering System, it's a copyrighted proprietary means of identifying the business. We talked a little bit about this. Uh, you can apply online and uh, like I said before, it can take up to six weeks to get this number. So it's important that you have it prior to wanting to submit. Um, it's a nine uh, character number, and as Megan mentioned before, oftentimes businesses already have these, they just don't realize they do. And you can, on the Dun & Bradstreet website, simply look up the business first before going through the application process. should also mention that it's not a barrier to starting your application, just to submitting it. So you can apply for one if you don't already have one, and then proceed with the REAP application. There's a lot of other boxes you can fill in. This is just one of them. You don't have to wait until it comes in and then start the whole application process. So Sam, uh, the System for Award Management, we talked a little bit about uh, before. This is, again, another numeric identifier, but specific to um, the System for Award Management. And so once you have it done, you can go to sam.gov and you can apply for this. This number should come through rather quickly if everything matches how done was submitted. If it doesn't, it can take a lot longer. We just had a farm who went through a six week process um, figuring out their, their stamp number. So just keep that, keep that uh, in mind. So again, if you want more details and you actually want to see how to apply for these numbers, because unfortunately I wish they were just as straightforward as doing an online application, but they're not quite just that straightforward. We do have a webinar on Thursday that's gonna go over that uh, more specifically. So we talked a little bit about earlier about what is commercially available. So you have to have commercially available. So it's uh, greater than a year proven uh, and reliable history. 
It's an established design. Uh, it has established design procedures and it's replicable. Um, there are professional service providers that know how to install it. Um, it's proprietary and um, a balance of system equipment equipment is available, it's readily available, and there's a valid U.S. warranty. So these are kind of the more specific criteria when we're trying to determine, okay, is this a commercially available um, criteria? So generally, this is not typically a concern because most of the time uh, farms and small businesses are going after doing something that is just automatically commercially available. They're not looking at installing stuff, something that's super customized and has to be specialized. Um, even then, it can still be eligible. It just simply depends on uh, is there something new that's being created that's never been done before, in which case that is not always uh, eligible. So uh, commercially available can also be um, provide a certification can be on the, the actual item itself, and it's a, a recognized industry organization certification. So some unique questions. We're going to go, how do you know whether you're eligible or not? So do I have to own the land I do the project on? So this is a question we oftentimes get with farmers who tend to lease or rent their land, but want to uh, make some sort of energy efficiency or renewable energy improvements on uh, the property which they control but don't own. So uh, you need to control the land um, where the project will be built, and there needs to be a lease agreement that demonstrates you're going to control the land for a certain period of time. Um, it needs really to be good for the lifetime use of the equipment, and, and the equipment has to go with you oftentimes. Um, so if it's, if we've had examples of this where we have, uh, uh, there's farm preservation land, it's owned by a land trust, but there's a farmer using the land. Um, the, that is a case where it's kind of a, a no-brainer that it's gonna be used for farming for the foreseeable future. Um, and, that kind of goes right through. There's other instances where um, we've had landowners simply sign a legal document saying they really have no intention of ever kicking the farmer off the land and they intend to renew whatever length of lease um, the farmer currently has. In which case, oftentimes those leases are long enough for the lifetime of, uh, of the equipment. Good. So another unique question we get, what if I only have one meter? This is really common um, with farms that have both a residence and they have their own operation. There's typically only one meter. Um, oftentimes what's required in this case for energy efficiency um, projects is you have to get an audit or you have, to, you have to get a load analysis to determine what is used by the residents and what is used by the farm. Um, and if you only have one meter, um, oftentimes as part of the project, you'll put in a second meter so that you really know what the farm is using versus what a resident um, is using. Um, the, for renewables, a load analysis can be done to prorate the eligible cost of the project. Um, same, kind of the same way a load analysis would determine, okay, you have 10 kilowatt hours of energy use, um, seven are, for the, are used by the farm, and and three are, are used by the residents. Well, only if you're applying for any sort of energy system that's going to cover both the residents and um, the farm, in that case that I just gave you, only seven of the kilowatt hour worth of energy costs would be eligible for um, the REAP program, and that other three would have to be covered. So it gets prorated depending um, on, on the project and how that load analysis determines what energy is being used where. Um, again, you can choose to get a second meter, and that's oftentimes what ends up happening. It just ends up being rolled into the eligible project cost that we talked about earlier. So another funky question we get is, can you build a new structure? So energy efficiency is not um, eligible under REAP with a new construction project. So if you're just building a whole new building, um, the pro and you're building it super high energy efficient, well, that's not eligible. The idea with REAP is um, it's energy efficiency, which means you have to have some sort of prior energy use to determine you are going to be saving energy. Um, this is a funky one where if replacing a building is the most energy efficient option you have, then it can be eligible. But again, you have to have an existing energy use with an existing structure and it has to be determined that, oh, you need to start from scratch and just rebuild. And that's the best, the best process in order to save the most energy. 
So that's one of the funky ones we've gotten. Um, it's very rare, but it does happen. Do you have any other, Megan, that has been funky like that? No, but people constantly surprise me. Yeah. Okay, so scoring and submitting your project. So here's a little bit about how um, uh, the point breakdown goes. So it's BTU per grant dollar. So all of the energy savings are converted to BTUs, which are just kind of the standardized energy. Yeah, it's, it's British Thermal Units is what it stands for. Um, it's a way to make all the projects equivalent. So if you're doing a solar PV project that's saving kilowatt hours and someone else is doing an insulation project that's going to save therms of natural gas, um, it would be hard to compare those like that. So they convert them all to a common denominator so that they can be more easily compared. Um, so you... That maximum of 10 points uh, per, per grant dollar. So basically, the more <laughs> more you save in energy per dollar that you're asking for, the more points you're going to get there. Um, energy replaced, saved, or generated, that's a maximum of 15 points. So basically, the more energy that is replaced or saved or generated, again, kind of per grant dollar, the, the, more, um, the higher the points you're going to get. The environmental benefits is maximum of five points. So if you're if there's, this is a, this is an interesting one to fill out. What are the environmental benefits of installing what your, either your energy efficiency or renewable energy system are? There are typically lots of benefits. Um, and so that's just an important one to kind of, don't just gloss over, because that five points can, can make or break if you've lost some points somewhere else. Um, commitment of funds, I talked about this a little bit earlier. It's really important to demonstrate that you have funding to actually implement the project, because like we mentioned previously, REAP is a reimbursable grant. Most grants are reimbursable. Uh, and so get, making sure you have a bridge loan lined up or that you have um, the, the ability to um, cover the cost up front is, is super important. The more uh, commitment of funds you have, the more amount of points you're going to get in this section. Um, so the size. Uh, of the agricultural producer, the rural small business, again, maximum points, the smaller you are, if you're, is, that, that's going to help. Um, if you're a previous grantee or borrower, um, you get a little bit less points. Um, and it's a simple pay, how quickly the payback happens for um, the project that you're going after, the more points you're going to get. So if you have a project that's going to pay back in seven years, and someone else has a project that's going to pay back in 10 years, you might get a little bit more points for the seven-year payback um, versus the 10-year payback. And then every year, um, the state director has some admin points. Um, I don't actually know what the focus this year is for uh, the state, but if you happen to also coincide with that focus, you can get a little bit of some discretionary points. Um, I'd actually have to ask what that is. I don't, do you remember what that is this year? No. I know, yeah. I, I, used, I knew at one point, but I can't pull it off my head. It, it changes, so that can be looked up as well. So this is important. So submitting the application, there are two ways to submit. So applications have to be sent to any Massachusetts, um, or, and again, if you are from Rhode Island or Connecticut and you happen to be on the order today, any Massachusetts, Connecticut, or Rhode Island office by 4.30 p.m. on the deadline date. It needs to be original, and it needs to be hard copy. So all original signatures. Um, applications can also be sent using GrantsNet.gov, but I, we've been advised don't do that. Submit it in person or mail it. So leave time to ensure that that happens. Yeah. <laughs> um, so once you've submitted the application, our rural development is going to review it for completeness and provide a receipt uh, for service. It's usually the form of an email. Uh, you might get a phone call uh, if there are some questions. And then they're going to score the project. Um, the, like I just said, the agency may call, a rep may call the confirmed numbers or ask for an explanation for certain things or get any missing information. Especially, they'll ask for missing information if it was submitted prior to the deadline. If you submit it on the deadline and it is incomplete, it is incomplete. And unfortunately, you're out of luck. You have to resubmit before the next deadline. So the deadlines, which we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, are March 31st, uh, 2018, and October 31st, 2017. So the October 31st is the one that's coming up. That one focuses on small projects um, or asking for smaller amounts of money. So there's a little bit more priority there for that. 
Um, and I believe any projects that are not funded but qualified do get sent to national. And that, the national competition is a little bit separate from the state competition. So there are multiple ways to potentially get awarded some funds for the project. All right. So reporting. So um, you, if you are awarded, if you uh, are lucky, and not lucky, but put in the hard work and, and you're awarded and you submit a complete application, uh, and you happen to score really well. There are report. There's reporting that's required um, once you've gotten the funds. Um, so, for energy efficiency, it's two years worth of reporting, and for renewable energy, it's three years worth of reporting. And we just like to give people a heads up about this that you don't just install the project and you're done. And you never have to answer any questions to USDA again. In this case, you, you will. You will have to maybe fill out a survey or determine that, yes, the uh, system that I installed is working the way that the proposal said it would. And this is just a bit of a follow-up to ensure that um, that the, the money is being spent wisely and that things are actually, um, the outcomes are actually happening that were stated in the application. And that informs changes in the future. So that's pretty much it for today. These are uh, this is the contact information. We do have uh, the USA rep uh, reach contact up on the screen, uh, as well as Megan and myself. If you do have any questions, um, I will open it up and I'll unmute people for for questions now. If that is the case, just give me a second in order to do that. There's lots of windows open on my computer. In a car. I don't know who that was. Someone, someone uh, muted themselves. So you can remute yourself if you want. But if anybody has any questions, uh, please uh, feel free to ask them now. You can also use the question section if that is easier for you. But other than that, that uh, is it uh, for today. Um, we can, if you would like, the uh, the binder that we mentioned earlier with all of the components that are required uh, to submit the application. Please uh, let us know, and we will send it to you. Um, uh, uh, at your convenience. Uh, thank you again for attending. And I don't know, Jonathan, if there's anything you wanted to add. Um, I know you're on the line. Um, hopefully, we didn't misrepresent anything. Uh, we've done this a number of times, uh, but it's always good to have a USDA person on the line. So uh, again, thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, please let us know. All right. Good job. Thank you. <laughs>